Hello everyone, my name is Stu Adler. Welcome back to Introductory Lectures in Thermodynamics. In the previous episode, we considered several foundational elements of thermodynamic theory, including the concept of a system of molecules, and the idea that the aggregate behavior of that system can be described using a relatively small number of path-independent state properties. In so doing, we encountered several systems where the molecules adopt more than one aggregate arrangement, or phase, at equilibrium. For example, in episode A1, I showed you a mixture of butanol and water, which splits into two liquid phases at equilibrium. In episode A2, we considered an isolated system containing liquid water and steam. Most recently, we considered the case of a mixture of saturated salty water and solid salt. All these examples involve systems with multiple phases, where molecules present in the system adopt two different stable configurations that remain in equilibrium with each other indefinitely. As we've seen, this has a significant impact on how we describe the system, including the type and number of independent intensive properties. This brings us to the topic of this episode, which is to explore in a bit more depth what exactly a phase is, and how we go about deciding how many phases we have in our system. Now to properly frame today's topic, I decided to start with a bad joke. A teenage ice cube lives with his parents in a freezer. On a particularly hot day, he comes home from school, half melted, dripping water all over the place, a cloud of steam forming over his head. Without saying a word, he marches straight past his parents up to his room and slams the door. One parent turns to the other and says, what's got him so steamed? The other answers, oh honey, he's just going through a phase. Yes, puns really are the lowest form of humor. But they do illustrate an interesting feature of our language, which is that words often have multiple meanings in different contexts. This is particularly true of the word phase, which is used for all kinds of things in science and engineering. So what exactly is a phase in thermodynamics, and how do we decide how many phases are present in our system? As we've been using it, the term phase seems to refer to a unique spatially homogeneous arrangement of molecules. But with complex systems involving different types and sizes of molecules responding to each other at different time and length scales, the word homogeneous can be somewhat ambiguous. What we really need is some kind of definition for a phase that helps us distinguish the type of equilibrium molecular homogeneity we usually speak of in thermodynamics from other types of homogeneous mixtures. So for our purposes in this course, let's define a phase as follows. Phase a group of atoms or molecules at equilibrium that is macroscopically homogeneous over a state-determined length scale. What do I mean by a state-determined length scale? Well, recall our simulation of a 2D Leonard Jones fluid. This model suggests that when we examine the behavior of a group of molecules at small enough length scales, we reach a point where structural variation and molecular fluctuations dominate the local behavior. For the continuum approximation to be valid, we need to average over a representative sample of these variations and fluctuations. For a liquid with small molecules, like water, the size of this representative sample is very small, nanometers. For gases, which have a long mean free path, this size is much bigger. For systems with larger molecules or more complex structures, such as polymers or proteins, we may have to average over even larger distances. However, as long as this distance is a natural consequence of the interactions among the various molecules in a given phase-intensive state, i.e. state-determined, we can, in principle, uniquely describe and predict the properties of the system as a single phase. On the other hand, if any variations in the composition and structure of a system depend on external factors unrelated to molecular interactions, it won't be possible to describe or predict the aggregation state of the system based on molecular interactions alone. For example, consider our physical mixture of saturated salty water and solid salt. Imagine we grind up the solid salt into submicron particles and agitate it until it becomes a homogeneous slurry. Even though the system is now homogeneous over a length scale of microns, the properties of the slurry will depend at least in part on how we ground up and disperse the particles, so it's not predictable uniquely based on a single set of phase-intensive state properties at equilibrium, such as temperature, pressure, and mass fraction of salt. 
In contrast, if we describe the system as a physical mixture of two phases, solid salt and salty water, it turns out we can uniquely describe and predict the phase intensive properties of these individual phases based solely on molecular considerations. This is really the focus of thermodynamic theory. The larger question of how the slurry will behave as a function of solids loading and particle size, for example, is not really something addressed by thermodynamics. To understand properties of the slurry, we would have to combine thermodynamics with other more macroscopic models, such as how small particles settle and become entrained in two-phase flow, which takes us out of the realm of thermodynamics and into the realm of transport phenomena and rates. Okay, so let's put this definition of a phase to the test by considering the following homogeneous fluids and reasoning through whether they can be legitimately described as a single phase from the standpoint of thermodynamics. The first is tap water. Before answering, let's first be clear about what our system is by drawing a control volume around the liquid so that we're not including the glass or air as part of the system. We should also recognize that the composition and structure of the liquid may be modified near the glass water and air water interfaces. For example, we see a meniscus indicating strong wetting of the glass surface by the H2O. You'll learn more about the thermodynamics of interfaces in Chemi 455. But for the moment, let's not consider these deviations at the interfaces and just focus on the bulk of the liquid. Most of us would probably agree that the water molecules and any other solutes in the water are going to be, on average, spread homogeneously throughout the system and will remain this way indefinitely, satisfying the criterion of being at equilibrium. The length scale of this homogeneity, as characterized by the average distance between the various types of molecules, for example, is established by molecular interactions and movement, and, then, and thus is tied to the thermodynamic state of the system, not dictated by the container or other factors of how we prepared this particular sample. So according to all the criteria outlined in our definition, tap water seems to satisfy the definition of a single phase. Next, consider tap water with a spoonful of lactose in it a type of sugar derived from milk. As you'll see, the lactose is initially granular and forms a cloudy mixture upon stirring into the water. So according to our definition, the system prior to full dissolution of the lactose cannot be considered a single phase, even though it might appear homogeneous during mixing because it has not yet reached a state of equilibrium. Also, the size of the dissolving granules is a function of time and thus not state determined. However, after all the lactose dissolves, we seem to return to the case of a homogeneous molecular mixture, just like the tap water. The length scale over which we must define homogeneity is going to be a little bit longer than in tap water, since as with many aqueous solutions, water molecules will form a hydration shell of water around each lactose molecule, creating larger, less random structures than in tap water. However, the size of these structures is determined by molecular interactions, not by the techniques we use to dissolve lactose in solution, so is state determined. So like tap water, an aqueous sugar solution seems to satisfy the definition of a single phase. Okay, let's try this one. Steamed milk. Milk is a solution of water, lactose, and other nutrients. Injecting steam warms the milk and entrains small particles of air, causing it to expand into a foam-like microstructure. Add a bit of espresso, and it's delicious. But is it a single-phase fluid? Well, the first problem we have is that steam milk is not really an equilibrium mixture. After a few minutes, we see that a lot of dense liquid separates to the bottom, leaving dry cappuccino foam on top. This would seem to immediately disqualify the initially homogeneous foam as a single phase because it's not stable over time. The other problem we have is that any length scale we choose to define the homogeneity of the foam, air bubble size, distance between lamella and the foam, is not state determined. The microstructure of the foam is a complex product of how the foam was made, including milk properties, steam flow, air entrainment, and barista skill. So according to our definition, this is a clear case of a physical mixture that is arguably homogeneous over some length scale, but cannot be described as a single thermodynamic phase. So now let's go back to a slightly simpler system and just consider homogenized whole milk. Whole milk is a mixture of water, lactose, and various other nutrients like proteins and fats. Homogenized whole milk is made by first skimming off excess milk fat 
and then breaking up the remaining fats into tiny colloidal particles, tens to hundreds of nanometers in size. This is why the milk is opaque. These fat particles remain suspended indefinitely in the liquid by natural surfactants and be polar molecules that bind to the particles, allowing them to favorably interact with water and preventing them from sticking to each other and settling out. Indeed, if we leave the milk on the counter for several minutes or hours, we don't see it change significantly. But can we consider milk to be a single phase? According to our definition, to be considered a single phase, the liquid mixture must be at equilibrium. For milk, this might be a bit of a gray area, since depending on how long we let it sit around and how stable the colloidal suspension is, we might be able to model it as an equilibrated system, at least for some purposes. If so, we might ascribe it homogeneous intensive properties, such as lactose concentration and fat content. However, we would not be able to predict all aspects of the milk structure as a single phase from these state properties alone. What about other criteria? Well, the fats are suspended on a small enough length scale to appear homogeneous. However, the small size of these colloids is not state determined. The size of the colloids is a consequence of the extrusion or sonication process that we used to homogenize the milk, not a natural consequence of mixing water and milk solutes inside a cow. Thus, a whole milk emulsion is kinetically stable over some time scale, but will not form spontaneously simply by mixing the molecular ingredients together under the right conditions. Based on these arguments, it's hard to argue that milk is a single thermodynamic phase. Note that this does not mean thermodynamic theory does not apply to milk. But to fully understand the properties of milk, we probably need to treat the milk as a multiphase mixture and expand our theory to include surfaces and colloids something you'll learn more about in Chemie 455. For now, however, let's focus on developing our understanding of thermodynamic properties in bulk three-dimensional phases. As we'll see in the next couple of episodes, the number of such phases has a significant impact on a system's degrees of freedom and places predictable constraints on how many independent state properties we can and must define in a given system. <laughs>